Good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to our NIHR SSCR webinar um, series. Um, this one is focused on um, end of life care, and we have Joe Dixon and Sue Duke, who are going to talk to us today in two separate sessions. Um, uh, both will speak for about 20 minutes and then we'll have some time for, answers, for questions after each session. Um, if you want to ask a question, if you could put that into the chat, uh, that would be really helpful. And then we can pick out some questions from there and uh, maximise our time. Uh, so welcome to all of you. Uh, it's great to see people here. And uh, I think we'll kick off with Josie. I think is the. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think I'm going to stop. <laughs> I'm going to share my screen. Right. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to present today about um, this study, learning from international models of advanced care planning to inform evolving practice in England. Mm -hmm. These, these are two papers uh, from the study, um, and as you'll glean from these. Um, they, um, the study focuses on uh, resourcing and providing advanced care planning um, efficiently at scale. Um, so just some background for, um, let's see if I can see a clock, just some background for people who might not be aware, um, just to explain what advanced care planning is. So um, general care planning, I think most people are familiar with, and it's planning for current and continuing um, health and, and social care. Um, whereas advanced care planning um, differs in that it involves um, expressing preferences for care in possible future health scenarios where you may not be able to speak for yourself. And it's usually undertaken where there's an expectation of significant um, health deterioration. Um, so for example, um, in the context of a, a diagnosis of chronic illness, and usually undertaken with support from a, a health or other care professional. Um, it, they can cover decisions and preferences around medical treatment in different circumstances and also um, preferences around how social and personal care is delivered. In the UK, um, one can complete an advanced decision to refuse treatment, um, to refuse specific treatments, and that's uh, legally binding. It can also complete an advanced statement uh, setting out preferences for medical and other kinds of care and you can assign lasting power of attorney for health and care and that's usually um, going to be a close relative. Um, the exact legal arrangements and, and terminology varies but there's um, a very similar framework in comparable countries to the UK so um, including the US, Canada, Australia and New Zealand where the field work for this study was um, conducted. So advanced care planning's uh, become really important. So why, why has it um, become so important? Uh, a key reason is that um, decision-making, uh, medical decision-making in serious illness has become increasingly complex. And this is because people are dying with chronic illness and frailty more frequently. So you've got um, drawn out unpredictable uh, disease uh, trajectories. Um, and there's also, at the same time, you've got increasing availability and use of potentially life prolonging medical treatments. Um, and together, um, you've, this is leading to people at end of life uh, experiencing higher levels of treatment burden and more frequently dying um, during and despite um, sometimes invasive uh, medical treatments. Um, and this isn't um, either ethically or financially sustainable. So this is the context um, uh, in which um, you, know, you have advanced care planning and it's designed to promote autonomy and person-centered care, to limit marginal and unwanted care and to encourage better um, use of resources. It's both a psychosocial and a procedural intervention. So it's psychosocial in that um, it supports patients and families to better understand their prognosis um, and also um, processes for making decisions about um, health and other care in, in serious illness. And it's also a procedural intervention. So it gives instruction and guidance to providers uh, care providers about the kinds of uh, um, care that, that somebody wants at that stage. Um, it's also been associated in research with a wide range of preferred end-of-life outcomes. 
Um, it's emphasised in, in policy, so as far back um, before then, but uh, from the end of life care strategy in 2008 through to the NHS uh, long term plan. And it's particularly emphasised for people with dementia. It's it's widely recognised that GPs are reasonably well placed to provide advanced care planning, but there is no single professional lead role. Um, and in terms of implementation, we know that in the UK um, and, and sort of elsewhere, really, um, advanced care planning support is um, quite sort of limited and, and patchy. Um, so that's the context. Um, now, just to say something about the study. So you, you kind of have the um, understand what we were doing. So what we did was identify um, uh, 12 international health and care systems um, that were actively working to provide advanced care planning support across um, the whole of their organisation, so at scale. Um, and we identified um, uh, systems in the United States, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, and these are countries where advanced care planning policy is um, pretty developed and it's generally recognised that practice is, is a bit ahead of that in the UK. So we wanted to find out um, how participating organisations uh, were staffing and resourcing their advanced care planning support and importantly what had worked for them and what hadn't worked for them and, and exactly why to look at models for involving different health and care professionals uh, and to try to gain insights into providing high quality advanced care planning support um, efficiently and at scale. We also looked at organisation, organisational rationales for investing in advance in advanced care planning support. I'm slightly aware of the time, probably rushing to slow down. Um, and looked at perspectives, a leader's perspectives on the economic case. But in the time I've got today, I'm going to focus on um, healthcare professionals and sort of ways of providing advanced care planning uh, more broadly, more more widely. Um, we took a qualitative approach and this was to elicit provider perspectives and to explore people's first hand experiences of developing and delivering um, uh, advanced care planning support across their organisations. There was also limited availability of quantitative data um, and limited scope for collecting that and we, we did look into that. So, we conducted in depth qualitative interviews with a wide range of um, staff, so leaders, frontline staff, managers, clinical, non-clinical staff, um, and then the data was analysed thematically using Invivo software. Okay, so um, the research, I'm going to move on to uh, findings, the research confirmed um, a range of, of you know, important challenges for delivering advanced care planning uh, support at scale. And, and these are three, I think, absolutely key uh, challenges. I'm going to say a little about each. So, yeah, the first was that with, there is no professional lead role. And this creates a range of problems. So it creates the problem of targeting management support and training and of creating systems of accountability for um, delivering advanced care planning support. It also limits the role of um, professional bodies. So they can encourage professionals to engage, um, but there isn't that extra leverage of it being a, a clear professional responsibility. And in this context, leadership was seen as, as really important. Um, I'm hoping that's just new. I can't see screen, can't see people. Um, so hopefully that's, that's all good. Um, I'm gonna carry on. Um, so leadership was, was, was seen as really, really important. Um, and this was important from um, system leaders and, and managers, but um, physicians were also seen to have a, a key leadership role. And, and many were advocating for advanced care planning support, um, both within their organisations and, and outside of their organisations. Um, some leaders said, um, you know, they, would, they, they weren't going to go back, but many leaders said they had to keep making the case. So um, leadership was also in this context really important for sustaining and protecting resources for advanced care planning support. So the second... Um, 
<clears throat> Second challenge, and this is probably um, the biggest one, is uh, lack of time. Um, and, you know, this is it comes up again and again um, and it's a problem we still haven't solved and there clearly is no single magic wand for doing so. Um, advanced care planning conversations take between uh, 30 to 90 minutes um, and that makes it really uh, difficult to address them in you know, short um, appointments, so GP appointments or um, specialist appointments and really challenging to incorporate with the delivery of other care. Um, the third uh, challenge is poor skills and confidence. And this, this is really important um, because it's uh, one of two key factors that were identified as, as being fundamental to how efficiently advanced care planning support could be provided. So the kind of skills and experience of facilitators on one hand, and the, the other factor was the information on educational needs of participants and how well prepared um, they were. So although this was a really, it's a really important barrier, it was a really hard one to address. So medical training generally doesn't cover end of life or communication skills. And as we've already touched on, um, nor do phys physicians generally have um, time to complete um, full advanced care planning conversations. Um, a number of organizations had invested in um, dedicated facilitators, but it was sort of widely felt that where um, expert clinicians were quite scarce, that wasn't really workable or, or scalable or sustainable. And it could lead to, uh, often did lead to advanced care planning being unintegrated with the rest of, of someone else's care. So also, um, you know, not really a, an ideal solution. Some systems, and this is probably um, similar to what we've, we've done in the UK, had invested in extensive training um, across the whole workforce. And what they found was that this wasn't sufficient in and of itself um, to increase provision of advanced care planning support. Um, first of all, not everyone wanted to, to do it. They didn't necessarily um, feel it was their role. Um, they didn't necessarily um, have the time to do it. And because it was across the whole workforce, staff weren't conducting these conversations sufficiently regularly to get their skills up. And it was also hard to target in-depth training. So um, these are three really sort of key challenges. So I'm going to talk a little about how, how the organisations we visited attempted to address these challenges. And many of the organisations had gone through various stages of, of trying to address these challenges. So one way to address particularly um, the time issue was to break conversations down into multiple shorter appointments. So um, uh, GP appointments or, or chronic uh, care appointments, uh, for example. And some uh, respondents um, said that they thought they were doing this, you know, fairly successfully. But the dominant view was that resulting advanced care planning support was, was very likely um, to uh, be of limited scope or squeezed out entirely, or, or just be very fragmented in what one uh, respondent described as, as, as gappy. Um, as we've already mentioned, uh, staff delivering care in this way may not be doing it regularly enough to get their skills up, so those conversations may not be being conducted um, efficiently or, or, or confidently as well. And this model didn't necessarily leave sufficient um, uh, uninterrupted time for potentially complex or emotional issues to um, come up. And it was likely that both facilitators and participants um, sort of didn't bring up issues because of this. So this is a model that's, that's pretty relied on um, uh, widely, but it, it far from uh, ideal. Um, I'm going to say something about conversation guide systems used a wide range of approaches and um, conversation guides um, and some were longer, some were shorter. Um, some staff had trouble navigating longer guides, especially inexperienced uh, staff. Um, but some preferred the greater guidance that they gave, but experienced staff tended to use these tools quite flexibly and so it didn't really affect um, how long conversations uh, took. 
in a number of systems as, as we are in the UK, um, they've begun using um, something called the Serious Illness Conversation Guide. Um, and this is designed to help busy acute physicians have uh, goal of care discussions. Um, and it's a very short training. The conversation itself is, is around 15 or 20 minutes. Um, and it was generally thought to be a really excellent tool, but it's designed for um, advanced illness and it needs to build on um, earlier advanced uh, care planning conversations and education if, it, if it's, if it's going to be meaningful. Um, and there was a concern that maybe it was being seen as, as an alternative um, and there was some concern about that uh, uh, rather than that, that earlier education and um, engagement and conversations. So role of physicians. Physicians were um, uh, widely considered um, to generally lack relevant education and in both GP, busy GP practices and in acute settings uh, were thought to lack the time to deliver um, full advanced care planning conversations. And there was a concern that um, if left entirely to physicians, advanced care planning conversations were likely to occur late, uh, be of limited scope and to insufficiently consider risk and burden. And there is re other research evidence that, that backs, um, backs that, that up. Um, but physician input was really important. It was really important clinically and also really important because a recommendation from a physician uh, was a really important influence in getting people to engage uh, with advanced care planning or, or, or to, to think it was relevant to them. Nurses, particularly uh, those involved in chronic disease management and uh, practice nurses, um, they tended to have longer appointments and repeated contact with chronically ill uh, patients. Uh, and for scalability, there, there are a lot of them. Social workers um, were seen as needing more support with the clinical aspects, but they were seen to be able to have challenging conversations really efficiently. Uh, and also with, with some um, caveats about possible de-skilling, to have facilitation and counselling skills and to have experience uh, and skills in, in working with families. In some systems, they were also quite plentiful and um, health social workers are less uh, prevalent here than in some countries, so the US for example. But I think there are opportunities presented by the growth of palliative care social work in the UK and by the greater engagement of, of social workers with people at end of life. Um, so opportunities there. So some of the examples where team-based approaches um, work really well were where there were naturally occurring teams of physicians working with nurses and social workers. Um, so, for example, in GP practices or, or specialist hosp uh, hospital uh, teams. And in this model, physicians uh, introduced advanced care planning and they retained involvement, but more time-consuming aspects were completed by um, less costly but still appropriately skilled um, staff. Um, some nurses and uh, social workers and systems uh, that were visited specialised in advanced care planning conversations and they had other work reallocated uh, to allow them to do this so they had the dedicated time. Um, it was easier to target um, expert training and it also allowed for volunteerism so um, people who were motivated and, and interested in taking on this work. And it, the team-based model was seen as aligning uh, well with uh, new models, um, a range of new models of care. Um, care homes are a really challenging environment um, everywhere. Um, there were reports of poor practice, so people um, uh, receiving forms, uh, tick box advanced care planning forms, um, alongside forms about food preferences uh, when they moved into care homes. Um, there was one organisation that had uh, gained funding to train care home staff to provide advanced care planning. Confident, there were high levels of staff uh, turnover and it was it was really 
costly. Probably the most um, successful examples of advanced care planning support in care homes were in reach teams of either palliative care physicians or um, nurse practitioners or uh, um, a practice, practice nurse in one case. Um, but they were really thinly uh, stretched. I've already um, uh, mentioned that participants' informational and educational needs were a key aspect in, in how efficiently advanced care planning could be uh, provided. Well, there were a number of ways that people could, be, um, could come to those conversations better informed and, and better prepared and helping to simplify conversations um, when, they, when they did occur. Um, so first amongst these is the use of decision aids. A number of systems were either using or were considering um, uh, the use of decision aids videos, that kind of thing, and, and particularly for common interventions that were often poorly understood. So um, artificial nutrition, CPR, uh, in one case, um, ending, uh, ending dialysis. Um, and, and decision aids could help simplify conversations. They could support um, non-physicians or non-clinical staff to have advanced care planning conversations and um, they can ensure that people received consistent information and people could uh, use the decision aids in advance of conversations so they could reflect on their priorities and, and think about um, questions that they wanted to bring forwards to uh, conversations and I think that's a really really important area for the future especially I guess in time of Covid. Um, another, I think, really interesting area were group-based uh, methods, and some systems had introduced these, um, either in the community, so kind of community-based um, groups, or in clinical settings, so in condition-specific self-management uh, groups, for example. Um, and what people reported were well, they were finding actually many people preferred this approach. Um, <clears throat> people could benefit from the wider discussion. They didn't have to contribute if they didn't want to, they could, they could mainly listen. And, and people could just kind of come along, see what it was about, um, without feeling obliged that they had to complete a, a written plan. Um, in all the examples I kind of came across, um, people could actually, if they wanted to, stay in complete documents afterwards, and there was support to do that, um, or in short follow-up, uh, visits, um, visits, appointments. And, you know, regardless, um, they would be better prepared um, for future conversations or, or decision making. And that um, involved obviously patients and, and their families, um, whoever wanted to attend. And then almost finally, um, uh, community outreach and, and, and publication, uh, um, public education. So awareness and understanding about advanced care planning and, and decision making could also be promoted and through um, community events and public education. So for example, think of, of, kind of dying matters or the death cafe movement or um, examples I'm aware of in London, there's um, a Gentle Dusk working in Islington and Compassion in Dying working with Health Watch in, in Lambeth. So those kind of community-based um, initiatives. Volunteers uh, tended to play an important role in community education. And it was also um, a really good way of encouraging participation from those traditionally less likely to engage. So in the US, there was an example um, of uh, a range of events that were organized around um, Day of the Dead in November, and that was to engage Hispanic communities and they'd work really, really well. Also, engaging with faith groups. So sessions were either run by um, faith groups that were supported to do so, um, or along with an advanced care planning specialist. And they could present advanced care planning um, in ways that might address religious concerns or possibly um, misperceptions. And it was also thought it could be an effective way to reach families and, and carers. So for example, um, carers of people with dementia um, through perhaps um, dementia support groups or dementia carer uh, peer groups or support groups. And importantly, um, seen as a way of, of potentially just generating um, public interest and uh, potential uh, demands for advanced care planning support. And very finally, 
I think I'm doing good for time. Um, very finally, um, uh, just to remember that advanced care planning um, is uh, intertwined, it's sort of part of a jigsaw of parallel system changes that are designed to reduce um, avoidable dependence on acute care. And, and probably if we think about the way forward, it needs to be kind of considered in this context. So that's me, thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing so I can see some of you. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have absolutely loads of questions on the chat, oh. and I'm not going to be able to get through more because I've got two minutes before Sue starts to. Sorry. Present. No, that's fine. Um, so I, I'm going to just pick one out, um, but I wonder if maybe Josie, you might have a quick glance at those as well Look. during the second half and one. see if there's any there that you might. But I'm wondering. Um, Camille asked a question about whether people talked mm. about um, these conversations with young carers and young adult carers and, and whether that raised any particular challenges, whether you came across that, because I, I guess the implication is yeah. the older people that are having these conversations. I, I know, I know Camille is probably talking about particularly young carers. I mean, the advanced care planning was generally targeted at individual patients and there they were then encouraged to bring along close persons to events or, or conversations um, so no not particularly um, to some there were there were examples of like ALS for example there were there were conditions that did impact young people I guess in a way some of the carers were actually um, probably parents actually in those, some of those cases. Um, not specifically, but I think it's a really interesting area. Okay, um, um, and then Sue, if you want to get your presentation lined up, we'll perhaps have one more question while you line your presentation up. Um, so uh, there's another question here about um, the amount of expertise and the background that people had in palliative care and whether that made a difference, Josie. Do they mean the, the, the people facilitating? Yes. I, I think um, one of the ways, one of the sort of challenges is really actually trying to skill people up who are not necessarily um, palliative care specialists to facilitate these conversations. So in a way, the aim was to get to a point where you didn't need that background. But, but it did, I think it, people did talk about needing and I guess that's some of the public aspect, just people being more aware that there are palliative options rather than about what you're not going to have or what's going to be withdrawn, that people are, are aware of what, what the alternative, what alternative forms of care are. So I think people leading this work saw that as a, as a really important part of their work, raising awareness for people that, you know, that care was not going to be withdrawn it was about what care you wanted okay thank you very much i'm really sorry to those of you who didn't get uh, a chance to ask um josie's findings will be out tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> i believe on the website yep. um and perhaps josie could have a look at those comments in the chat anyway and see if there's any that you want to get back to but in the yeah, meantime well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank very you, much. Josie. Thank you. Um, and now I am delighted to introduce uh, Sue Duke from uh, Southampton, who is going to talk to us about um, some work looking at supporting family caregivers in the transition between hospital and their relatives' preferred place for end of life. So thank you very much, Sue. So thank you, really happy to talk about this work. This work can stem from our clinical experience um, as nurses recognising that um, family members often had very minimal support during the discharge for end of life care. And we wanted to have a look a bit more about how we could do that better. So just some acknowledgements about the research team and our funding. Um, but the real rationale for the study comes from the understanding that transitions at the end of life are um, emotionally laden. They often signal the severity of a family member's illness. People um, who are at the end of their life are likely to be transferred in and out of hospital at least once in the last six months of their life. And so family members, it has a real significance that um, the end of life is approaching. It's characterised by uncertainty and um, consequence um, psychosocial distress. Because 
um, the dying processes are often uncertain. Um, it doesn't give people the um, understanding about what's happening necessarily. So it, it's a real sense of just not knowing what's happening. And family members also describe how it's exacerbated by the discharge process, which they often experience as chaotic and haphazard and is often chaotic and haphazard due to um, the different agencies that need to be involved and so forth. And nurses and other healthcare professionals often focus on the need of the, of the patient and the organisation needs and rarely focus on family needs. And therefore, consequently, family support is rarely provided. And um, families describe how um, it doesn't really matter, doesn't seem to matter how much they might ask for the um, kind of support, the kinds of information that would help them um, the system within hospitals isn't necessarily designed to provide them with the information and support they need to care well for their ill family member. So the study aims were to co-construct a support intervention for family members during the transition of care from hospital to home or nursing home for end of life care um, with a social family care orientation to be delivered by healthcare professionals in hospital and to assess the usability, acceptability, and um, accessibility of the intervention and the factors that influenced implementation. So we were really interested in, could we um, change the current state of affairs with family support? Could, would it be possible for healthcare professionals to be able to provide support to family members in a way that helped them make informed decisions about their role in end of life care? and also in a way that helped them pre um, be prepared um, for end of life care, or at least able to harness their resources and link to resources in the community. It's important to say that um, for this study, we defined family with um, family members who had cared for a dying person as um, people who were involved in the direct support of people who were dying, or in their care or in the organisation of their care. So anybody that was um, the patient or um, close family members considered important to the system of care that was going to be provided to that person. So our study de design was a participatory learning and action research design. Um, it consisted of four cycles, which I'm going to describe here. Um, at the beginning, we knew that there were some interventions that had been um, well researched, well tested in randomised controlled trials to provide psychosocial support to family members during end of life care. And we wanted to understand what made those um, interventions effective and to design an intervention that was suitable for healthcare practitioner delivery in hospitals and then to pilot that to make sure that um, it was workable, usable, didn't disrupt normal practice and normal care. And if that was the case, to roll it out um, in a bigger scale in implementation and to qualitatively um, evaluate that implementation. Because it was a PLA action research study, we worked with um, different groups of people as co-researchers so we worked with five members of the public with experience of caring for a dying family member and they were involved in the um, co-construction of the intervention, the things that they felt were important were incorporated within the process of the intervention. We worked with 45 clinical co-researchers, all nurses and um, occupational therapists working in hospital end-of-life care teams. We chose that group of um, clinical people to be co-researchers because we wanted to be confident that we were working with clinicians with communication skills that um, would be sensitive and um, capable in this situation. Um, we wanted to be able to see from the qualitative evaluation whether the inter intervention worked or not without needing to um, be training people in communication skills to deliver the intervention. And I'll come back to that a bit later. And we also worked with social and healthcare experts and um, all of those co-researchers were involved in the design, the implementation and evaluation of the study. Um, theoretically, the study was um, 
uh, founded on normalization process theory, which is a social process of implementation. And it describes the work that actors, the social actors involved undertake in order to implement an innovation. And um, so it helps us to understand the um, dynamic interaction between um, an intervention and its context. And we um, considered intervention to be a time and space bounded activity and patterns of behaviour that were influenced by roles, relationships and resources. So um, instead of looking at um, when we're looking at the factors that are influencing implementation, we were interested in um, how the co-researchers roles and relationships and the resources available to them influenced implementation and whether the intervention had a potential to change the dynamic of the hospital system so that um, family support was provided. Um, we had different data sets, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail later, but they were all brought together. Sorry, leave that slide up a minute. They were all brought together um, in the qualitative e evaluation. So um, the process of intervention development um, consisted of a thorough review of randomised controlled trials, which tested interventions um, for psychosocial support at the end of life and um, of two intervention manuals resulting from those studies or from some of those studies and from that work we identified three intervention mechanisms um, which were asking about concerns coaching problem solving and facilitating action planning um, the tested interventions we decided were not suitable for hospital practice because they consisted of several um, a series of interventions which wouldn't be possible in the quick turnaround of um, hospital discharge practice and they were often considerable length up to up to 60 minutes in length whereas um, we know that hospital interactions are often serendipitous and um, consist of short periods of time and um, all of those facets um, from the studies were discussed with our co-researchers and then using those active um, mechanisms, we modelled them onto a normal conversation using performative theatre. So that was a case of, um, of us asking with the participants working out how um, a normal conversation in practice might go using these active um, in mechanisms um, for the purpose that we were intending. So there are two important foundations of the intervention. That evolved from those workshops. So understanding that it's a significant care transition characterised by uncertainty and that appropriate support can positively influence coping, families resilience. So um, we built those mechanisms onto family sense of coherence, which is um, argues that a family's resilience and their ability to cope with stressful events is influenced by meaningfulness, comprehensibility and manageability. And this theory has given us um, a good framework through which to um, shape and to design a conversation with family members to support them. So the family focused supporting conversation is the result. It has three intervention components um, that we uh, that together form a short structured conversation um, the first component, meaningfulness, taken from the theory, is often addressed by um, recognising the significance of the situation and um, providing an opportunity for families to um, recognise that. So we might say something like, we know this is often a difficult time for families and leaving a pause. The research evidence shows that using an empathetic statement followed by a pause um, enhances the chance of um, people raising their concerns. And then comprehensibility, the second component, asking about concerns and their implementation, imp, sorry, implications. So asking, have you talked about what's been happening as a family, wondering what kind of concerns have been raised? And then addressing those concerns by um, facilitating action planning. Um, so after the first cycle where we designed and clinically modelled that in the skills lab and talked about it with our PPI, um, with our co-researchers, we undertook a pilot implementation over three months 
to assess the um, potential for the intervention to be used in practice and whether it, it caused unexpected or undue disruption. And we undertook that implementation in three NHS trusts that consisted one acute hospital in each trust and um, one palliative care team in each trust. That implementation was undertaken by a total of seven clinical co-researchers who were specialist nurses and occupational therapists. And um, the evaluation was assessed by practitioner reflective analysis of the interventions provided, a support course during the implementation time with each team and an evaluation meeting. Um, two teams joined together for one evaluation meeting, hence why there's two and not three evaluation meetings. Um, that showed that there was a potential for it to be used in practice. So we, um, I'll show you the key results in that in a moment. We then undertook a rollout implementation over further six months, which um, was aimed to assess the usability, accessibility and acceptability, and the factors influencing implementation of the family focused support conversation. In this um, part of the study, we work with seven NHS trusts, which consists of nine acute hospitals, 12 teams, and um, from the, um, all palliative care teams across England were invited to take part and from those that voiced interest we included um, teams where um, to provide populations with diverse economic and ethnic ethnicity. The implement, um, intervention was implemented by 45 clinical co-researchers and again assessed by reflective analysis, support calls and evaluation meetings but we also um, asked family members who had received the intervention to complete a questionnaire and um, six of those people agreed to be interviewed in depth. So evaluation. The intervention was implemented and the um, co-researchers um, said that it took no more time than usual in the pilot. Um, the pilot co-researchers said that it pulled their practice apart it flipped the conversations to focus on the family and moved from something that we did to families to a focus on family concerns. And in the rollout ev evaluation, we found that the intervention was usable, accessible and acceptable. It changed the nature of family support. Family members felt valued and supported and it equipped them to provide care. It was influenced by the relationships between specialist and ward teams. So if the um, specialist teams and ward teams had a flexible approach to discharge planning and to which practitioner was doing um, family support, then intervention um, implementation was considered to be a little easier. Where negotiation was needed to change those pre-existing um, agreements about which part of discharge planning um, the teams were doing, then um, the specialist practitioners renegotiated that and often then delivered the intervention alongside the ward teams. And in addition, the intervention was sufficiently flexible to take count of um, case pressures and conflicting priorities. So sometimes the specialist practitioners would um, telephone a family member and deliver the first part of the intervention and then meet to talk about um, the concerns raised by family discussions and um, make a plan together. Here's some of the um, flavour of how um, family support was changed. Practitioners described it as the colour of family support being changed. Um, previously, we focused on the patient. We had a paternalistic or arrogant approach of what we could offer as a team and professionals and what the family needed to do. Now we asked family members their concerns. They described how it changed their interaction or practice with family members how previously they design, um, delivered lines like a script in terms of what support might be available to them. Whereas now they um, explained that it made us listen to what the family had been thinking about and their thoughts to solutions. Family members felt valued and supported. Um, very often that, that first question about, we know that this is a really difficult time for you as a family um, caused an emotional response, but family members said it was because people were um, concerned about us, that they were caring for us. Um, the intervention also informed family decision-making. It helped them to think through their concerns and facilitate conversations with other family members. 
one family member said, although it was really difficult, it's that awful torment, isn't it? You want to know what you don't want to know. But once they did know, they were able to prioritise and um, plan or to make decisions um, whether or not they wanted to be involved. And one family member said, it's difficult to say, but the fact that my mum was dying sort of wasn't in my mind anymore. What was in my mind was to get her home and start looking after her at home. I wanted her to be at home. I wanted to be in her own bedroom. So it helped them to prioritise what they were going to focus on. We found um, the co-researchers described that the intervention was readily implemented. It didn't take any more practice, um, time than usual rather, and often saved time. It was flexible. Um, I've talked a little bit about the relationship between specialist and ward teams and how that influenced um, implementation. And um, it helped the specialist practitioners to legitimate, legitimate um, <laughs> to reinforce the importance of their family work. And um, overall, we, the co-researchers said that it helped to enhance the sustainability of discharge because family members were making an informed decision about their role in care. So we found that the family focused support intervention was usable, accessible and um, acceptable. It enabled healthcare practitioners to provide family centred support during end of life care transitions. And importantly, it focused on meaning making, supporting family members to understand the significance of end of life care discharge and to make informed decisions about their role in care. So that's a little overview of um, our study. That's <laughs> great, Sue, thank you very much. Um, so we have a couple of comments on the chat for you. Um, I think, Hannah, you've posted a couple of things. Do you want to ask a question? Is Hannah there? Hannah Newsom? Hi, Hi, it's, Hannah. It's, Hi Sue. Hannah. it's Sue. I've got my daughter's name up on the, um, on the chat. All oh, right, sorry. <laughs> um, I think there the needs to be one person coordinating it. Um, I mean, I've had a couple of instances. I had my dad years ago um, where a lot of the healthcare staff, I mean, I'm an ex RMN, about to be an RMN again, um, and I was considered a hindrance in my dad's care because I actually knew something about what needed to be done yeah. uh, and often staff on the ward I mean I actually had one um, tell me that um, my, dad's, my dad's medication was staying as it was because um, I'd asked for him to be sedated and that's just the way it was and walked out um, what I'd asked my dad to happen was not for him to be awake for 72 hours yeah um what they'd actually done was um sedated him on chlormathiazole to the point where he was so sedated he was falling over which is different um and i also had a situation recently where one of my friends um was from hospital two days away from dying and nobody discussed with her family anything mm. about end of life care mm. um but and I ended up discussing it in the garden because we were in the middle of lockdown. <laughs> mm. So, I mean, I think there's a couple of things. There needs to be one person um, that's responsible for coordinating sort of discharge planning um, and discharge care. Um, and also respecting families because a lot of the time it's the first time they've been through something. It might be day in, day out for professionals. Um, I mean, I'd, you know, I'd done it professionally. It's a whole different ball game when it's your dad. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, sounding a lot as if th th there's a lot of a, a, a point about information that, that families need information in order to think about what they might need. Yeah. The, the co-researchers, and when they were asking about concerns, they would often then go on and prompt, have you thought about how you might manage overnight have you thought about that kind of thing so um first of all they found that um by asking about family concerns things came up that they weren't expecting that was the first thing and then set, when they thought when they had gone through their mind about what kinds of things family members would need to know about to care well for somebody they would then do that kind of prompting and um there 
there isn't time really in the, in the presentation to give you a good feel of that but that was about have you thought about and or have you got a have you got a idea in your mind how you would like this to look so i mean it, with my friend it was a really quick diagnosis she basically mm. had a diagnosis and was then in hospital for two weeks came out and died two days later mm. um so it needed to be a very prompt discussion with her family mm. and a lot of support given in a very short space short of time, time. Yeah. Um, and that didn't happen mm. Mm. Um, we've got another point on the the chat sue from nikki mm. um, i'm hoping this is actually nikki's name <laughs> this time i got this right um, talking about a term that i have never heard before um is this where a death doula could support is her oh, question um i i understand the term like a birth support but a death support or a doula um i think i think the the difficulty with presenting this research is that we're focused on um supporting family members and it could well be that um the next part of our work would be looking to see who can provide this kind of support who could use this conversation but i the principles of it i've been talking um to the student nurses who've been supporting people in hospital families from you know during covid and the principles of the conversation are readily usable and so yeah i i can imagine different people using the principles of this conversation to support family but also maybe to support um, other other staff members as well for example what kind of concerns is this um, generating for you so very possibly but the um, in this initial research is about healthcare professionals don't support family members to understand the meaning and the comp you know the, the sense of what's happening um because generally speaking they're focused on patient needs and um helping family members understand what those patient needs are rather than understanding um taking a family approach and supporting the family as a system and harnessing their ability to care that's great thank you very much um and liz is asking about um publishing the research. So uh, what I can tell you is that Sue's uh, final um, report is again imminently about to appear on the website. So um, in the next few days that will be there as well. Um, so you'll be able to read about that. And I I, I don't know have you put a, 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 whether either you or Josie have actually, whether there's any kind of publications other than the SSCR one out in the, out in the ether at the moment. Look at the front of my program. The two papers. So there are yes. Yeah. Uh, Sue's had less time. Josie, stop showing off. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're, they're um, with the publishers now, so we'll get we'll, it'll get done in the next little yeah. while. You know, in due course. Marvelous. Okay, yeah. but but both both of those will have um, SSCR findings, which are a very accessible read mm. um, on, on on the website very shortly. So, I think um, probably. Uh, time to say thank you both very much for those contributions I, I kind of feel like we didn't quite have enough time to to to, to uh, do that in depth because they're both incredibly um, interesting but also there's lots there uh, and I, I feel like there's a, an audience here who would have liked to have talked a lot more about that so thank you both uh, very very much for that um, and thank you to everybody who who um, pitched out to listen um, on a on a lunchtime. Um, I think it's probably a good idea to point out that on the 8th of September we have um, some of our capacity building awardee internship um, colleagues who are going to um, do a couple of presentations and um, so uh, it'd be good to see some people there for those. Um, and the next SSCR webinar is on the 15th of September and there we will have um, some talks that are largely sort of focused on physical disability so Philip Whitehead will be presenting some results from the bath out study which uh, looks at bathing adaptations in homes of older people and um, also Mike Clark will be presenting on his scoping review of changing places facilities so that's what's up next but once again thank you all very much for listening and to our contributors contributors, uh, Josie and Sue. Thank you very much. Thank you all soon. Thank you very much.